This next song that we're going to sing this morning uh, is called No Longer Slaves. And our students have um, led us in it several times, but we've never led it as a worship team. So this is our first time singing this as a worship team and uh, leading you all in it. But this is a song that, that resonates with, with our students, and I think we'd be remiss if we left them out. So the song says, I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. You unravel me with a melody. You surround me. I'm 
He's still changing us and making us new. And this next song talks about that, how he's making beautiful things out.
pray that we would have the courage to ask you to change us. We pray that you, we would have the courage to connect with those around us and get accountability to change our hearts as agents of your grace. We want to be transformed, God. We want to be made new. We want to be more like Jesus. And it's in his name that we pray these things. Amen. housekeeping that I need to take care of here this morning and I'm looking and I'm seeing Derek and Krista are here and I'm seeing Kyle and Anna are here and I'd like you guys just to come up uh, Derek and Krista and Kyle and Anna have come up and gone through what we call a membership class I'm not seeing George and Jamie is that right Chris? George and Jamie were also a part of that class as well uh, come on up just real quickly. Give a, let people have a chance to see who it is that has become new members. Some of you may be thinking, well, I don't understand what membership is. That's A-OK. -okay. Just stand right over here if you would. Thank you. Uh, that's okay. We offer membership classes. It gives you a little idea as to what membership is. Attendance is great. We love it. We encourage it. Everyone is free. But there's a, something different that happens with membership. Membership is when we look at what does it mean for me to be fully committed to this local body. And these people have gone through that class and said, they've signed and said, yep, I'm all on board with what's going on here at Alliance Church and we want to be a part of it. So your new members for 2019. George and Jamie Myers, they're not here with us this morning, but they also include George and Jamie Myers. And we have Kyle and Anna Walker, and then we have Derek and Krista Paulson. So by all means, give them a round of applause. <laughs> Pass that down to Derek. Pass this down to Krista. Pass this to Kyle. And you can keep this one for yourself. Thanks, guys. Very good. You guys have a seat. So we're starting a new series this morning, and it's going to be fun. It's going to be a little bit challenging, and I hope that we find that within this series that we are honestly face-to-face -face with the Lord, maybe in a way that we haven't been either in a long time or maybe even never have encountered. We're dealing with this, this idea and this look, if you haven't picked up on the theme of pottery this morning. We've got some neat little things going to be happening here soon. But I wanted to share with you my first exposure to pottery. Okay? It was a very young age. I was a gifted child, as so I was told by my mother. So she invested in me at a young age to, to start my work with pottery. And, and this was my first clay. We all had this, didn't we? You know, now... A days, I'm too cheap to buy Play-Doh, and so I just have my wife make it. You know, she deals with early childhood stuff anyway, so it's just it's a piece of cake for her anyway. But this, was, this stuff was great because the idea of this was, and this is what pottery existed when I was a kid, you take it and you shove it in the bottom side of a cow, and then you could take and you could get the, the cow to grow hair coming out the top. And it was just the coolest thing. And so then you could take it and you could squeeze it and then you would decide, well, you know, he needs a little haircut and you trim off the excess and you keep causing the cow to grow more hair. This, to me, was pottery. It was a lovely thing. Until something happened when I hit junior high in art class, Mrs. Knudsen brought up real clay and started teaching us how to work with and form clay pots. And I remember my exposure. She got out this wheel and she, first thing she did is she sat down at this wheel and she began to throw a pot on the wheel. I never understood why they call it throwing pot. Okay? So in junior high, this is your exposure to it. Do you have any idea how many jokes you can do with the idea of throwing pot or throwing pottery in junior high? And you can even take it literally. Right? So here you have a junior high boy, and you're telling him you, it's class time, you're going to throw pottery. And they're just like, this is all excited, because now they think this is the idea, they're going to grab things and start smashing and breaking them against the wall. Right? Throwing pot is basically just taking the clay, throwing it on the wheel, and then you're going to begin to form it. Well, the other thing with junior hires is when you give them clay, you know, when the teacher's not looking, if you get it wet, it's sticky. And so then you can throw it up onto the ceiling, and then it stays there because it sticks until it starts to dry out and harden. And then it acts as these little falling projectiles for your classmates as they're unsuspecting walking by. And 
I wasn't the best junior high student, but I was enamored with this wheel. So here was Mrs. Knutson, and she throws the pot, and she talks about what you have to do to this piece of clay. And she says, the first thing you have to do is actually center it on the wheel. You've got to get it centered. And so she, she throws it down, and then she be begins to mash the clay and just shove it down, and it spreads out. And then she kind of forces it back in, and she kind of repeats this process and makes this clay moldable. And then once she starts molding, and then she talks about it, and then what you do is you start with your thumbs right in the center, and you start opening up this little bit of a hole on the top of the pot. And then you start pulling it up. You're going to start forming your pot. And you start pulling it up. She made it look so easy. You know, and then you, once you get up to a certain height, you'll trim it. And then you begin to kind of shape the different shapes of it. There's different tools you can use. And then when it's done, you let it dry. You take it off of the, the, the wheel. You let it dry. And then you're going to basically, once it goes through that drying time, then you're going to glaze it. And you're going to throw it into a big hot fire and make it hard and beautiful. And so when it came time, once she had finished her demonstration, we each of us got a turn at the wheel. It was a lot harder than it looked. You know, I remember throwing the first pot. I probably still have it somewhere up in my, my parents' attic. If they saved it, it's only for posterity's sake because it was not worth a hoot. Okay? So I throw the pot and I begin to, kind of, to mash it out and whatever that is, pull it, and basically I get up to a certain high and then what happened? It flopped. I'm pretty sure that when we say a plan flops, this is exactly where it comes from, is it's a pottering term, pottery term. Whereas I'm, as I'm creating this bowl, it decided to do, and one side just totally folded in on itself. I took it off the wheel. I said, I'm done. We killed it. We had stayed that way forever. You know, just totally locked into place. But it's this idea of, you know, pottery is something that's been around for like ever, it seems. You know, we see it all the way throughout Scripture. In fact, the idea of potholes, there's some rumor. I don't know if it's true. I could not verify it, but there's some, some belief that the word, the term pothole, when you're driving down Minnesota roads and it comes into the spring and all that freezing, you know what happens, and it creates this big hole, hole in, the, in the road. The belief is, or what I've been told, what I've, what I've learned and read, is that apparently these potters, these people who would work with the clay, would go out to the road and they would actually cut some of the clay out of the road and take it back and use it then in their clay, in their pottery work, leaving a hole in the road, and so that became a pothole. Maybe, I don't know if that's totally true or not. It seems plausible. Whether it's accurate or not really makes no difference to me whatsoever. But throughout scriptures, we find a number of places where it talks about pottery. You'll find uh, David, in the recording of King David, there's one time where he's out in the wilderness this is after he's been king. I believe Absalom is maybe even um, in the picture and, and going after him. So he's out in the wilderness. And as he's out in the wilderness, they basically have to take all of their supplies with them. And so they list off these a number of pottery containers, and they had to load up these pottery containers with things like water and their grains and their barley. And all of their goods would have been packed into, instead of these plastic totes that we use, would have been packed into pottery jars. That's what they used. It was throughout the scriptures. I mean, it, everything was there, and it had a different purpose for everything that they would be needing for the trip. Job, if you know the story of Job, Job was a righteous man. Satan comes to God and says, he's only righteous because you have blessed him, and God says, have at it. You can do whatever you will. Takes away all of his family, all of his possessions, and Job still doesn't uh, turn away from the Lord. And then he says, well, what if I make him sick? And God says, have at it. Go ahead and make him sick. Well, he does that, and he ends up getting these sores all over his body. And Job, it says, uses his pottery to scratch. You know, if you ever got those itches on your back, you have those back scratcher sticks, they're like magic. That's what pottery is used for in Job's story. We find pottery also used to make clay tablets. Okay, the stone tablets, the Ten Commandments, that was with stone, but they oftentimes use clay tablets also to be able to write on. When the clay is soft, it's easy to write on, and then it dries, and then it becomes hardened, and you can take it, and that can be your note, your message. We see it in Ezekiel chapter 4. It's a wonderful story if you've read Ezekiel. What ends up happening in Ezekiel is God tells Ezekiel, go and cut a chunk of clay. Okay, go get a brick. It's got to be soft. And then what I want you to do is I want you to draw on this brick, I want you to draw a picture of Jerusalem. And then, once you've done that, I want you to lay siege to your clay. And basically laying out this picture of what's going to happen to Jerusalem. It's really a fascinating picture. 
We see that Elijah used clay jars, these huge clay jars to go fill up with water. If you remember the Elijah versus the, the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel. And so here they are. The prophets of Baal have been calling down on their God, lit, light fire to the altar all night long. Nothing has happened. They've been at it for like four hours. Nothing's happened. They've been cutting themselves. Still, nothing's happened because their God is nothing. And Elijah then says to, this, you know, to the people around, he says, take these jars, go and fill them up with water, bring them back, and then douse, douse the, the altar with all this water. And they do that repeatedly. And then God lights fire, despite the fact that everything is soaked. It's interesting, the clay jars were what they found the Dead Sea Scrolls in. You know, think about this now. So you have this clay, and you form a pot, and so it's totally sealed on the bottom, and you get it up on the top, and then you make a lid that's going to fit that. And they actually then took a wax, and they would seal it. And so these Dead Sea Scrolls that they found a number of years ago were actually sealed inside of a clay jar. I mean, the the way that they used clay in these pots... It's just there's no limit. They used clay, and, and this wasn't Israel. This was actually Babylon. When we talked about it in the series of Daniel, they found these, these clay cylinders, like the clay tablets, these, these cylinders, and they would write on these cylinders, and so they would basically keep turning the wheel, if you will, and they would read whatever was recorded on that. And you find some of these include stories of who Nebuchadnezzar was and some of the other happenings of Babylon at that time, in that time of Daniel. It's fascinating. That's what they used the clay for. Its properties were perfect to fit with that. We find in the book of 1 Corinthians where we are referred to as basically these jars of clay that hold this precious treasure. And I never fully understood that. I mean, it's almost like we're this safe place where this great treasure can exist. Like the Dead Sea Scrolls almost stuck inside of this clay pot with a seal around the top of it. It's like they were there and they were a treasure inside there. Likewise, we are a clay vessel, easily broken, that holds an amazing treasure. It looks basic on the outside, but the treasure is remarkable on the inside. And that's the Holy Spirit living in us. So here's what we're going to do this morning. It's not going to be long, but I think it's going to be a lot of fun. I'm going to invite Rachel to come up. And Rachel's going to work at this wheel. And while we're looking at what's going on with the wheel, I want to share with you a story that we find in the Scriptures. It's out of Jeremiah chapter 18. It's a wonderful passage. So if you remember Jeremiah, Jeremiah was a prophet during the time of Daniel. Okay, we just were recently talking about Daniel. And while Daniel was in exile to Babylon, Jeremiah was the prophet of Judea. And he was the one that said to Daniel and things like that, how long this exile would last. He's the one that told Daniel and the rest of them, he says, Keep this in mind, people. I know the plans that I have for you. They're plans for you to prosper. They're not to harm you, despite the fact that they've been sent off into exile. And so here you have Jeremiah, who's been given these kind of prophecies, and God does an amazing thing with Jeremiah. Listen to this story. So in Jeremiah chapter 18, <clears throat> verses 1 and 2, this is what it says. This is the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. God says to Jeremiah, he says, go down to the potter's house, and there I will give you my message. And so basically what God says to Jeremiah, Jeremiah, I want you to go down to the potter's house. I have something I want to show you. I want you to watch this. And as you watch this, I want you to understand and hear the message that I have for you. So here goes Jeremiah. He goes down to the potter's house. And as he goes down to the potter's house, he arrives there, and he sees here is the potter, and he's working. And he's working on a, a piece of clay. He's on the wheel. And then he's basically, as he's watching, he's watching exactly what I described before. We're watching, he's watching what Rachel, in a sense, is doing right now. He's starting to open up that clay. Jeremiah is watching this all happen. He watches Jeremiah start to pull on the edges of that clay. He watches the potter make the trimmings that need to happen. He watches, he watches the potter starting to shape it. And as all this is happening, something really curious takes place. There's a bad spot in the clay. There's a bad spot in the pot. And watch what happens in the midst of this. In verse 3, so he says, So Jeremiah goes down to the potter's house, and he saw, he saw him working at the wheel. He saw what it is he was doing with the clay. 
But then he says, but the spot he was shaping from the clay was marred in his hands. The word marred in this uh, literal translation of this would literally mean ruined. So here Jeremiah is. He goes down and he looks at what this potter is doing. He sees how he's shaping the clay. And as he's shaping it, Jeremiah sees the pot is ruined. It's flopped. Something has happened with it, and the pot is ruined. It's, it's, it's not what it was supposed to be. It has been affected. It has been damaged. And so Jeremiah's like, well, what, what do we do with this? And now look at what happens and what Jeremiah encounters and what he sees. And God wants Jeremiah to understand this. God wants Jeremiah to see this, and I believe it's the same thing for us too. He wants us to understand what is going on here. But he says, but the pot he was shaping from the clay was marred in his hands. It was ruined. So the potter formed it into another pot, shaping it as seemed best to him. Sometimes I'm convinced that we get to this point and we feel like, ah, oh, I've made so many mistakes. I've messed up so many times. I'm a ruined pot. There's nothing worth building any longer. And we kind of write it off sometimes and say, why bother trying anymore? I'm just a ruined pot. But this picture that God wants Jeremiah to see, and this is exactly what he saw, this is exactly what he said, but the pot that was marred, the pot that was ruined in his hands. So the potter formed it into another pot, shaping it as it seemed best to him. And then, after Jeremiah had seen all this, then the word of the Lord comes to him. And this is what God says to Jeremiah. This is so cool. Listen to this. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. And he said, O house of Israel, can I not do with you as the potter does, declares the Lord. As this potter is molding and making and forming this clay, can I not, can I not do to you what the potter does to the clay? And then he goes on and he says, Like clay in the hand of the potter, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. It seems so simple, and yet we're so easily distracted from its truth. You know what I mean? Sometimes we kind of resist it, and we'll talk about that more maybe in a couple of of weeks. But here what we have is we have this potter who's making the clay, and we have the clay we see verses, we'll look at them and maybe hear, hear a few in a little bit. But what God is in a sense saying is, look at what the potter's doing. Who has the right to choose what's going to be made? Can the clay say to the potter, don't make me this way. I'd like to be different. Don't, don't, don't give me that ability or why, why can't I have this instead? We don't get to choose that. The potter gets to choose that. And sometimes we mess ourselves up and we get ruined and we get marred and yet God is doing this restoring work to Israel. You know, in the context of where Israel would have been at at this point when Jeremiah was given this prophecy would have basically been Israel had already turned to idolatry. They had already been marred. They had already been ruined. And yet God basically says, I know you've been ruined. I know you've been marred. But guess what? I'm not finished working on you yet. We may find ourselves this morning, and it's like, I feel like God doesn't have his hands on me whatsoever. Like we're just a lump of clay sitting in a Plato pot. But that's not the truth. The truth of it is God's hands are always on us, forming us and shaping us and making us. We may feel this morning that perhaps I'm complete I'm, I'm done. I've, I've been formed. I'm, I'm good now. I'm just like some of these pots that we have here. It's like I'm finished. I'm nice. I came out, I came out good. I'm happy with what God has made me. I'm done being on the wheel, God. You don't have to shape me anymore. And then what ends up happening is we find ourselves falling off the ledge and cracking into many pieces and feeling like God's got some major work to do. Ironically, And this had to be a family member, and I'm throwing someone under the bus here, and I don't know who yet. Rachel came, and when she dropped this off, Rachel made this one, and she said, someone broke this and didn't tell me, and then they glued it back together. (laughs) Had to be a family member. (laughs) 
That's so funny. But that's kind of the idea is that basically we get to this point where sometimes we think we're done and then we realize, wow, I guess I don't have it all together. I guess I'm in a, month, a bunch of tiny pieces. And then God does something amazing and he kind of puts us back together. And I think, honestly, you did whoever did this did a nice job, way to go. Uh, but I think God does an even better job. You know what I'm saying? What I want us to understand this morning as you, whether you want to be or not, you're a lump of clay, but you're a lump of clay in God's hands. Now, how you're going to respond to that, we'll talk about in the next couple of weeks, but it's a beautiful place to be as a lump of clay in God's hands. Because then when we look at some of the things that we struggle with, we look at some of the anxieties and such that we feel, and we can know that he's doing something good. When we look at our neighbors, we say, why do they get this and I don't get this? And we find this rage of jealousy and this whatever we're dealing with in that capacity. He says, I haven't created you for that purpose. I've got something else in mind for you. He gets to choose. We don't get to choose. That's what's so crazy. You know, and I heard this, it's only somewhat fitting, but one of the fascinating things, you, we, we celebrate our birthdays, you know, like, way to go, you got, you got older, you know, we celebrate our birthdays, we celebrate basically the day that you had absolutely nothing to do with, you know what I mean? You had nothing to do. If you don't know what I'm talking about, you can talk to your parents about it later if you're too young for that, okay? That's something different. You had nothing to do with your birthday, okay? Fathers had quite a bit going on with that. It was a busy day. They had to go and get water and ice chips and things like that and rub their wife's back. It's a very, very trying time for them, I'm sure. However, the idea of it is we celebrate, way to go, it's your birthday. But we had nothing to do with it. But yet, what we celebrate is this fact that we're a lump of clay in God's hands and he formed us and that's what he made us to be. Is that not remarkable? I have just a couple of passages of scripture and we're going to kind of wrap up. Nice work, Rachel. Thank you. The idea of of choosing, there's some things in life we do get to choose. You know, we, we get to choose what we're going to wear in the morning. We get to choose this, that, or the other thing. But there's some things we don't get to choose. You are here. You did not get to choose your hair color. You did not get to, unless you do some coloring, that's supposed to natural. You did not get to choose your natural hair color, okay? You did not get to choose whether when you try to grow a beard, you get a bald spot right here, okay? You had no power in that. I don't know what the deal is. I can't grow hair right here. This side, if I could take a picture of growing a beard, Adam, you grow a nice beard. If I could take a picture of growing a beard and just have it like this side, it's like, wow, he grows a nice beard. And then I turn to this side, it's like, wow, you are a freak. <laughs> so if you see me after a vacation, you're saying, why does he just have a beard on one side of his face? Then you know, that's, I didn't shave, and now I, that's where I have. You don't get to choose those things. There's some things you do get to choose. I remember with Isaac as a boy, we gave him choices. We gave him too many choices sometimes. Isaac, would you like your pizza cut into triangles or squares? You know, he said, I want squares. You cut it into squares and you just throw a fit and scream. I want triangles. You don't get any more choices. We don't get to choose how God has created us to be. We do get to choose whether we will submit to his hands in forming us. A couple of passages of scripture, real briefly. Look at these. Colossians 1. For in him, this is about Jesus, for in him all things were created. Imagine Christ's hands literally forming the things of the world. Things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. There's that purpose. All things have been created through him and for him. You did not get to choose how you were created, but yet you were created with a purpose, and that purpose is for him. Jeremiah 1, the word of the Lord came to me saying, we've all heard this, but do you understand the intimacy that's going on with this passage? God says to Jeremiah, the same prophet we just talked about seeing the wheel, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. You see that purpose? I appointed you as a prophet of the nations. In other words, before you were born, I already knew exactly what I was created, and now I formed you, I have made you, this is the purpose that you serve, and you are going to be a prophet to the nations. 
Romans 9. One of you will say to me, this is Paul's writing here now, then why does God still blame us? For who is able to resist his will? Verse 20. But who are you, a human being, to talk back to God? This is that imagery of clay. Who, excuse me, shall what is formed say to the one who formed it, why did you make me like this? You may not be satisfied with yourself, but that is a lie that Satan wants you to believe. God doesn't make junk. He knows exactly what he's making, and he has made you, and he is still forming you. You are a lump of clay that he is still forming and making some beautiful things out of. Why did you make me like this? Does not the potter have the right to make out of the same lump of clay some pottery for special purposes and some for common use? You may feel like all I am is just a common person. Perfect. God's got the special ordained purpose for you. Romans 9, verse 24, even us whom he also called, not only from the Jews, but also from the Gentiles, as he says in Hosea, I will call them my people who are not my people. I will call her my loved one who is not my loved one. You may feel like God's got his hands totally off of you. You may feel like you're not even on the wheel. That is not the truth. You are there. God loves you. His hands are on you. His hands are shaping you. His hands are forming you. And this is how he looks at you, and this is how he feels about you. He says, I will call you my loved one. Jeremiah 18, verse 4. But the pot he was shaping from the clay was marred in his hands. Are you feeling marred? Have you been marred this last week, this last month, this last year? Are you feeling like, I am just a mess? The pot he was shaping was marred in his hands, so the potter formed it into another pot, shaping it as, he seemed, as, as seemed best to him. And the word of the Lord came to me, and he said, Can I not do with you, Israel, as the potter does, declares the Lord, like clay in the hand of the potter. So are you in my hands. A couple thoughts just to wrap up. It won't be long, it'll just be real simple. We don't have to be afraid of what God is doing. We don't have to be afraid of what is God going to do if I allow him to mold me, if I allow him to do the uncomfortable things and kind of do that pulling and that shaping. I don't have to be afraid of it. It might be uncomfortable. Certainly drying out is uncomfortable. The intense heat that it takes for pottery is uncomfortable. The idea of pulling and pushing and prodding, that it feels and sounds uncomfortable, but God knows what he's doing and he's making something amazing out of it. And so even in your times of stress and anxiety and discomfort, not that we should stay in those capacities, but I do believe that he's using them to help shape us into who he wants us to be and it's for a divine purpose. And so if you feel like you have, number one, lost your purpose or have no purpose, you're wrong and you need to come to Christ today and say, Lord, I want to be moldable clay in your hands. Mold me. Or if you're feeling like I'm done, <laughs> there's nothing else I can do. I'm the perfect pot. I hope you fall off the counter and crack. That sounds harsh, but let's be honest here. Until we find ourselves in a place where we are needing to be fixed, where we're needing to be molded again, we will just remain a pot on the shelf. And so it is my heart that if you're feeling like I'm good, I don't need anything else. My life is knockout perfect living the dream i have jesus here i am in the pot i hope you get knocked off and it kind of goes like this is really hard it forces you basically to get back on the wheel if you will to allow yourself to be centered in him to allow yourself to be formed in him this is for all of us we have to be molded clay i will say this over this last week it's been absolutely Challenging and remarkable as I look at this and I, I, I study it and I always want to own the passage. I always want to feel like, Lord, you need to do this work in me first. And I feel like this is, I don't like that when things are not easy. I don't like having to be stretched. I don't like being convicted of, of sin and, and pride and other things like that. But as he's doing that, I find that, okay, I will allow myself to be molded. And that's where I want us to be. Because I believe in what Lane said this morning, that we are all to be transformed. And as we enter into this series on transformation, I want us to be soft, moldable clay. Maybe once again, because maybe we haven't been for a long time, I want us to be soft, moldable clay and say, Lord, I'm just a lump of clay. You get to do what you want. I'm going to invite Lane and the worship team to come up. And as we do that, I want you to reflect 
what is the condition of your heart? What is the condition of your clay this morning? Are you hard? Are you moldable? Are you centered? Your pick fell, I'm sorry. Reflect on it. Use this time of worship as to acknowledge who he is, submit yourself under him, and then lift up your praise and acknowledge all that he's worthy of. And say, Lord, I am just a lump of clay. Sometimes I feel like I want to be more than what you've created me to be. Sometimes I feel like I want to be different than what you've created me to be. But Lord, help me to be that which you have created me to be. Let's worship. Think to yourself and, and pray. Ask God how he can transform you. What can wash away my sin? What can make me whole again? Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. 
So may you come to see that you are a lump of clay. And that's a good thing to be. It's a good place to be. Because you're surrounded by the hands of a creator that loves you dearly and that wants to create and form and mold you into that specifically which he has created to be. So let him be moldable clay. May you find yourself giving yourself to the Lord saying, Lord, help me to be molded by your hands and rejoice in that. If you're here and you've been marred, you've been hurt and you've been broken, it's okay. Say, Lord, you can continue that work that you've begun. Invite him to do so. And maybe you're finding yourself needing to be knocked off that shelf. Say, Lord, I'm not really excited about that, but by all means, if you need to, knock me off that shelf. Let me pray for you. Lord, I thank you. What an amazing story that you give to us in Jeremiah where you take him down to look at what this potter is doing and then you tell us that's what you do. That's who you are. You're a creator. But more than just a creator of the universe, which is magnificent in itself enough, but you create intimately. Your hands are on us and you're forming us. We even find it in the book of Genesis where you created all things by speaking them into existence and then... It says you formed man. You used your hands and you made him into the image that we are. And then it says that you breathed your life into us and you gave us that life. Lord, give us a fresh sense. Give us a fresh movement of your spirit to understand you are in the midst of shaping us and molding us. And it is hard to be molded. We feel the pressure. We feel the pulling. But Lord, thank you for your love enough and your intimate love to be able to make us for your purpose. Help us to submit ourselves to your sovereignty. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, Baptism candidates, we'll meet. I'm going to get us some coffee first to give a few minutes. Maybe we'll shoot for 11 o'clock if we can up in the upper chapel room.